project to project. If there's one, um, oops, sorry. If there's one uh, constant that it strikes me from the dozens and dozens of uh, projects I've been involved with, with mobile data collection, it's the fact that um, no one is, is the same as the other. There's quite a diversity. And um, the motivations vary as much as the particular circumstances. But within this lecture, I'm going to endeavor to communicate to you some of the most unique uh, areas of, of need and contribution for smartphone and, and wearable data collection that really, um, I think, set it apart uh, from other types of data collection. The particular studies you're anticipating may not tap into any of the particular opportunities I'm highlighting here. But by highlighting them, I'd like to encourage you to think a little bit broadly about whether any of them apply to your circumstance and hope to orient you as to um, the broader uses of these technologies okay. um, within the health and, and health sphere, which is the, the, the thoroughgoing, um, uh, thoroughgoing uh, focus of, of this work. Okay, so um, I am going to um, uh, t to um, jump into this. Um, I'd like to begin by talking about some challenges associated with um, uh, with existing techniques. Um, some areas where uh, traditionally or increasingly uh, we encounter um, uh, encounter um, particular difficulties. And I'd like to then um, talk about some of the unique features of smartphones um, as uniting um, two different spheres of enormous importance to health and health behavior and its understanding and its influences, namely uh, factors within the physical world and the electronic world. And I'd like to then go into a set of use cases, a set of particular examples where the uh, mobile data collection ends up being uh, of, of particular value. So one observation here is that there's a broad set of spheres that for decades, if not longer, we've been aware in health and health care have been underserved and under evidenced by traditional measures. Um, the NHANES 3 study in the States in the 1980s brought to our attention the, um, the big gap between self-reported physical activity on one hand and what accelerometer data uh, suggested. Um, similar studies have looked at uh, profound differences between what people state as far as uh, their nutritional intake on widely separated survey instruments versus what's actually captured by um, closer, closer observation. Our own work has shown big gaps in location. Um, uh, location, uh, with respect to location between what's self-reported and where people are spending their time. And one study conducted on this campus, we found uh, undergraduates um, would, would mention uh, patterns of, um, of, of spending time that were very, uh, where they spent time, that were very different from what was recorded using uh, uh, GPS and other smartphone-based locationing mechanisms. When we actually looked at where they spent their time on, on uh, campus, it was like night and day from their claims. Uh, a lot of their claims were things they were spending time in the library, spending time in the classroom, spending time uh, in, uh, in the dining area, plus Riel in the, uh, the bus, uh, in the bus uh, depot. And we found that their actual, their actual patterns uh, geographically and within the buildings were at night and day difference from, from their, these claims about where they were spending time. Similarly, in terms of with whom they spent time, their social context and spatial proximity, Often there were big gaps between what they were reporting and, and what we picked up 
Um, and uh, as a result, we found ourselves wondering about the reliability of a lot of traditional self-reporting in many of these areas. So one, one challenge here is that a lot of key factors that play into risk, that play into resource availability, that play into uh, health behaviors, are difficult to measure in a low burden, high accuracy way using traditional instruments. At the same time, um, the uh, tried and true methods where this data can be collected without undue burden and uh, fairly reliably through, you know, say, collecting self-report information via random digit dial surveys on telephones has become harder and harder to secure. Um, telephone surveys are becoming increasingly non-representative and expensive when you dial people on landlines. Uh, a lot of people, uh, not evenly distributed by age, screen those calls out. Those who do answer tend to be skewed demographically towards older individuals, um, sometimes individuals seeking a degree of social contact. Um, and as a result, uh, many who have relied very heavily on telephone surveys uh, for larger scale panel instruments or, or other in other contexts have found themselves dealing with escalating budgets uh, to achieve the same level of, of data quality. At the same time, there's a proliferation of, of, of content channels that, um, that makes it more challenging to reach potential participants to opt into studies and more challenging to um, to get individuals to, uh, to participate uh, or to deliver, deliver their responses. Um, some some uh, now conduct surveys via Facebook, others uh, via email, others via SMS, others via um, mechanisms for browsers, um, and smartphones uh, play a role as, as an option there. There's also certain, um, uh, certain demographics that are, are challenging to, to reach with uh, traditional instruments. Youth are one of them. We, we have a lot of people coming to us with an interest in smartphones because they find it difficult to reach out to younger populations. But vulnerable groups, um, uh, underrepresented groups, demographic groups who have, who have different subcommunities centered around different platforms are also distinctive. Um, at the same time, I want to highlight that smartphones serve as this unique nexus between two different worlds, both each of which is rich, both from the perspective of evidencing health behaviors, interests, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs on the one hand, and influencing those. Um, so, so a smartphone carried by an individual, in some sense, uh, rec records and records routinely as part of existing software um, run by various commercial agents involved, largely without meaningful consent, um, a wide variety of aspects of context, whether it's aspects of, of, of physical context, circulation in different environments, aspects of, of the food environment, uh, physical location, which may may expose people to uh, messaging, for example, people's to-ings and fro-ings, and even aspects of social context in the world um, can be uh, readily captured within smartphones. At the same time, smartphones are, are in this intriguing position of being the nexus for contact with all sorts of electronic uh, influences as well, whether it's um, whether it's YouTube videos or Facebook status updates or tweets, um, whether it's aspects of the food environment uh, as indicated by Yelp reviews or Instagram or Snapchat messages. The smartphone is, is sort of the conduit for a lot of those messages um, coming into a person and in turn posts from that person say to Twitter or posts um, that are made uh, via, via Instagram uh, or Facebook updates give us un some understanding of attitudes, beliefs, um, knowledge on the health sphere and to some degree health behaviors of an individual. So smartphones have this sort of unique straddling position between these two worlds. Two worlds which are increasingly important, each of them, 
for understanding health behaviors, but also in terms of their influence on health behaviors. For example, physical location, um, in as much as it mediates access to a food environment, to a messaging environment, uh, to aspects in the built environment germane to physical activity or sedentary behavior, um, and social context is of great importance for understanding certain aspects of health behavior and exposures. But at the same time, this electronic world, particularly for youth, plays an increasingly large role in, in shaping aspects of, of behavior and, and of belief. So smartphones here have a unique straddling role that places them kind of at the center of action, uh, whether desirable or undesirable, with respect to many people's lives and with respect to evidencing what's going on with that person's lives with respect to, uh, to health. Now, reflecting this, there's a set of needs that have emerged within the past half decade or so, going back a full decade, for mobile data collection, um, which have motivated study after study in, um, um, in uh, drawing us to the use of mobile health technologies. And I'm going to go through these quickly. Um, reflecting that we want to move on to very substantive uh, material for the, uh, the balance of the day. But this is to give you some sense of why many people use these phones. One of them, and probably the single most common reason that people use smartphones is um, to capture self-reporting in a more accurate and lower burden way. Two, because of this device we carry around in so many circumstances, um, and, and used ubiquitously, it also provides a very natural place to ask questions. And there's many components of this in terms of low burden. Um, uh, and you'll see many throughout the week, as, as in these other uh, sort of key, uh, key motivators, a bunch of aspects uh, of this that are enabled by Ethica, whether it's audiovisual reporting, reporting photos of food that you've eaten, or photos of a barrier to physical activity, uh, or a video of a uh, service dog engaging with an individual who's, um, who's suffering from uh, PTSD. Whether it's aspects of automatically capturing where a given um, uh, type of health behavior is taking place, or with whom it's taking place. Uh, uh, smartphones can can play a high role in lowering the burden because, uh, because they allow for reporting and auto automatic reporting that uh, supplements um, what otherwise could be quite burdensome description uh, of, of uh, those set of factors. Smartphones are, are very, are offer intriguing potential by contextual triggering. We'll hear this quite a bit in the course of the week. Mohammed will show you how we can use Ethica to trigger surveys, say, based on the presence of a beacon. So maybe it's uh, when you are nearby your prosthetic limb, something that um, Alan, um, Alan McLean has explored. Or maybe it's uh, when your service dog hasn't been nearby for a certain amount of time. You want to understand why. We can, we can trigger instruments based on context that are significant. Another example being uh, questionnaires about uh, uh, aspects of exposures. Maybe it's um, your exposure to a park uh, or to an adverse, um, an adverse built environment from the point of view of physical activity. And questions can be asked just at that time, proximate to, the, um, uh, to that exposure. There's the capacity for proactive reporting of an individual and to answer questionnaires at any point, to defer them until later, answer them in that checkout line in the grocery store and wait to complete it until later in the day, and the capacity to break these things up into to bite-sized instruments. Um, at the same time, smartphones are not merely provide a, a route towards lower burden, but often greater accuracy. And one of the reasons is, is lower recall bias. We can ask a question about why you're in a park when you're in the park. We can ask a question about your satisfaction with 
with a, uh, a, an exchange with your healthcare provider while you're in the provider's office or shortly thereafter. We can ask about what you've eaten at a time proximate to your eating rather than two or three weeks later, as some of Cheryl's work is examined. Um, so here, we can, we can gather reporting at a time that's less likely to be thrown off by the vagaries of, of memory or, or, or um, subsequent events. Um, secondly, there's less of a need to mentally aggregate over time. What I mean by that is um, there's a big difference between asking how many fresh fruits and vegetables, servings of fresh fruits and vegetables do you think you've, you've eaten per day for the past month? There's a lot of calculations that go on there because, you know, Okay, you were at the, the you were at a you know a set of holiday events during that time. Um, also during this time, you were doing some traveling, um, and uh, there was also that friend's wedding. Um, and it's a bit hard to combine all that in your head and give an accurate reporting. Whereas if you're asking, you know, once a day or every meal, you're often imposing less of a less of an abstract question for that person. And so they're thinking in more concrete terms about, okay, what did, you know, how, many, how many did I have today? Thinking about the particular meals. Um, often um, audiovisual you know, documentation, like a photo of the pills you're taking, a photo of the food you're eating, provides a very you know, succinct sort of summary of it that's, that's more clear than, than simple self-reporting. Um, and, um, and finally, um, uh, there can be a reporting, a more complete reporting of symptomology that doesn't precipitate care seeking. So if I'm feeling lousy today um, and uh, I may not go to a provider to seek care for it, but I have the opportunity with a, with a phone to report that I'm sick. Uh, Cheryl has uh, conducted this wonderful foodborne illness study and you know, people were exercising that reporting of feeling ill far more frequently than they reported seeing a provider for that illness. And so this can give a, a sense of exacerbations like, like uh, Erica is exploring in, in uh, some of her work or, or um, uh, aspects of, of uh, symptomology that are uh, brushed under the rug through traditional studies but may be important for uh, for understanding absenteeism, et cetera. A second major motivation here is, and, and this is a central one, to understand outcomes, um, patient reported or recorded automatically, cognitions and behaviors related to risk factors, and I include exposures here, um, and specific uh, pathways. I do a lot of modeling, I think a lot about generative pathways, mediating influence from one thing to another. And one thing that really attracted me very early on, actually before I came to the UFS, I started at MIT, I started doing work with uh, sensor-based data collection and had a strong interest in how it can inform our understanding of health behaviors. And one of the reasons is the longitudinal depiction that it can offer. It, it kind of offers um, uh, an opportunity to, as it were, collect biographies of exposures and behaviors over time. So there might be a person who sought care at some point. That person, if we want to understand what precipitated that or what led to that, you know, this may be an individual uh, did a lot of work uh, with surfers in Southern California, um, believe it or not. I may not seem like a surf personality myself, but um, uh, I, uh, I certainly worked with many who were and um, Good folks. So in this context, um, you know, we might have an individual sought care for highly credible gastrointestinal illness, but um, that individual suffered pangs of it previously. Um, they may have bathed at, at a certain beach here, which had risk ratings, which are recorded through municipal instruments, um, through the sampling that's done, that indicated different enterococcus levels and there may be certain periods where they were bathing despite beach closures and, and advisories being posted. Very real phenomena in Southern California, and one that precipitates likely 
tens to hundreds of thousands of recurrences of H, uh, HCGI. Or maybe you're dealing with um, you know, tick-borne illness and, and potential Lyme disease and a set of symptomology, perhaps early on not enough to precipitate parasitic, was, was preceded by some exposures like a tick that was found and a rash that appeared but was never brought to the attention of a care provider. Um, for PTSD, perhaps we have uh, training with the service dog. Um, we have instances of acute flashbacks by, uh, by a veteran with PTSD. This is work that uh, Jenna is helping to, uh, to lead. Uh, I'm not sure if Jenna's in the room at the moment. But, uh, but uh, she's, she's doing some wonderful work with this, and Artemis um, uh, and Colleen Dell. So you have, uh, may have flashbacks occurring. There's a period before they got the dog where these may be more acute. It's accompanied by poor quality sleep and sedentary behavior that's more pronounced um, and lower levels of social engagement. Following the introduction of the dog, perhaps the flashbacks because the dog recognizes particular signals of stress for that person and they're trained all through this period to to intervene to cut off flashbacks before they become visceral. Um, the dog brings them out into a, to a community of others uh, with dogs, um, helps the individual with lower, fewer flashbacks and, and the dog providing uh, interventions that lower stress levels, um, uh, better quality sleep, and by the dog bringing them outside, they get more, more uh, uh, levels of physical activity and less sedentary uh, behavior. Um, so these sort of uh, biographies are the sort of things that can be picked up and evidenced using data from combining self-reporting and combining automatic recording of, of where people are and linking it with um, things like was the beach closed or what was the risk rating for that section of the beach historically. Um, other things that can be reported are things like pharmaceutical intake and evidence with photos um, and, uh, and not surprisingly aspects of location and physical activity and social context and communicational behavior including say app use and screen time um, as well as uh, uh, aspects of, of, of decision making. So we can gather information, this is from work with uh, Harvard. Um, on message exposure to individuals. Uh, this is from Houston. Um, we have comparable data from lower income communities in Massachusetts. Um, so this is gathering sort of where people in the study spent their time and we can cross link that with where the um, tobacco related billboards are, for example. Where are billboards uh, promoting, um, uh, promoting particular types of cigarettes. And there's a wide variety of, of health areas, specific health areas where this information can be, um, can be useful. I'll just provide those there. The slides are available on the site if anyone wants to sort of delve into my, my thinking on that. Another area I'd like to talk about the contributions from these uh, tools being uh, of, of particularly great value is really enhancing the speed, reliability, and depth of learning from, from interventions. And this goes a long way to this notion of causal pathways that I referenced earlier, but I didn't, I didn't show anything on. So the idea here is, look, um, consider a, an intervention like a uh, smart dog. A smart, smart dogs. Yeah, that's, that's a great intervention. Um, uh, Erica could, can attest to that. A smartphones in the context of, of um, uh, service dogs. Um, uh, or consider an intervention like moving a family from a low-income environment to a, a, so a low-income um, area of housing to a mixed-income uh, area of, 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 of housing. Um, within these cases, often we are um, interested in understanding the overall impact of that intervention. Was it successful or not? But an important set of takeaways that we can bring, that we can elicit increasingly with tools like this or why was it, what worked, what didn't work, what aspects of it were successful and what aspects did it fall short. 
what, what aspects of the intervention may have been working at cross purposes for each other. And this gets to the whole issue of causal modeling, which many of you know I, from this very floor I teach on and other events. Um, but the idea here is, and this is one of the big draws to me of this sort of work with smartphones, to be able to use tools like smartphones and wearables to understand why an intervention worked, how it worked, so that even if it wasn't successful, we've advanced our learning and we know what we could do better next time. If it was successful, we could probably know how we could do even better next time. Okay. Um, so the idea here is look, okay, so if people are moved, a family is moved from, from a low income to a mixed income neighborhood. Um, and maybe we're interested in some broad outcomes such as the impact on obesity levels. This is actually based on uh, the, the motivation for this was most immediately stirred up by some work by Jeannie Brooks Gunn at Columbia with whom we collaborated but also uh, the Moving to Opportunity study more generally in the States, if any of you are familiar with that. Now, if you think about the impacts of an intervention like this on obesity, they're, they're manifold, right? Um, they're multifactorial. So uh, a family um, in this new environment um, uh, might, uh, their, their obesity levels might be materially affected through many different particular pathways. Some of them are through the perceived safety of that environment, which motivates higher levels of moderate, vigorous physical activity. Kids can be outside at night and, and can use the parks more readily and um, can use you know, ball courts with, with less risk uh, later into the evening. And as a result, it, it leads to, to lower BMI and, and, and improved obesity levels. Um, uh, it can also lead though you know, that, that move can also precipitate greater access to recreational space. There may be more green space in that new neighborhood, which stimulates moderate to vigorous physical activity. So it may be that it's not so much through perceived safety, but just there's, there's more green space around. Or it's a more walkable neighborhood, and that leads to more being out on the sidewalks and walking to the bus stop. Um, uh, with with less um, with less trouble walking to school, and that lowers um, lowers BMI through that, uh, even if it's not moderate to vigorous physical activity necessarily. At the same time, perhaps some of the effects on obesity are through healthy food availability. We're we're not dealing with a food desert anymore. We're dealing with an area where there's good food stores in place that have health healthy fresh fruits and vegetables available. We have. Um, more more proximate access to uh, to neighborhood markets and it improves healthiness of diet and that leads to uh, favorable changes to obesity. So when we're dealing with a blunter outcome like obesity levels and through broad self-report, um, often it's it's hard to reliably know just how much things have been changed along the way. I mean, we can ask how much walking are you doing or, or your perceptions of safety. That one might be a little bit more reliable. And, and we, we certainly know something about the availability of food, but asking people how frequently they go to the grocery store might not be, might not elicit um, great accuracy of responses or about their healthiness of diet. With, uh, by contrast, with uh, mobile data collection, there's a, there's a hope that we can actually start to look at these particular pathways. For example, how much are people engaged in sedentary behavior before and after? Or in moderate to vigorous physical activity through accelerometry and heart rate. Um, we can look at, are people going to, open, to their own neighborhoods? To what degree are they tapping into the grocery stores? Uh, to what degree are they, are they visiting them? To what degree are they outside at night, right? Uh, to what degree are they making use of the extra green space? Or is it more that you know, they're just engaged in less sedentary behavior? We can start to probe these things. There's no silver bullet. This is not you know, immediately obvious. But once we have a more fine-grained, temporally uh, um, you know, temporally uh, granular type of way of measuring these things, we can start to figure out what might be going on along these different pathways that would explain why we see these changes in obesity levels. For those not familiar with moving to a, uh, moving to opportunity study, obesity levels did improve 
for teenage girls. Um, for teenage boys, it was not significant, and there was actually some adverse outcomes uh, measured, I think it was in um, uh, likelihood of school graduation and pro-criminal involvement. And there were hypotheses advanced, you know, about movement of the boys to the old neighborhood without parental supervision. But it, without a strong evidence base to back it up, it's hard to move it out of the realm of, of um, a conjecture. Whereas with these tools, we can, we can probe these things more, more effectively. Um, okay, now a key subcase of this, of this need to understand why interventions work, how they work, where they can work better, to understand along different particular pathways what's going on which incidentally is of great importance for dynamic modeling, for, for those for whom that's a meaningful statement. Um, there's a key subcase here involving why we use these tools. And a key subcase has to do with interventions that are mediated by the phone. And as many of you know, there's a, a large and rapidly growing literature on smartphone delivered interventions. These are not merely studies seeking to collect information from smartphones, but seeking to deliver an intervention, nudging people by smartphones, sending SMS messages, um, encouraging them to engage in certain types of uh, uh, pro-social behavior or, or positive physical activity or what have you. And um, uh, smartphones have, have been of great interest in in this regard, because of their ubiquitous uh, uh, tonnage and because of their, their, the ongoing contact that they offer, etc. And they're very convenient. Um, now, if you're engaged in intervention delivery with those tools, conducting smartphone-based data collection to accompany that is a natural pairing. Why? Well, for several reasons. Um, the, the one thing is, per my previous slides, it gives a strong sense of intervention impact. You know, what, what changed when you, when you deliver this intervention to encourage um, greater levels of, um, uh, of physical activity with a social support group, did you actually see them, you know, engaging in, in more moderate to vigorous physical activity and less sedentary behavior? Did it change their, their, their interaction patterns with, uh, with others? Um, these are things that can be recognized, and you can tease that out from recognizing changes to diet if you have questions related to that um, that, that can be well evidenced on the phone. But beyond that, beyond getting the sense of intervention impact before and after, pre and post, as it were, you can get a sense of intervention exposure, because if you're capturing on the smartphone their use of the smartphone, how much time they're spending with it, um, when they, when they had it on, um, when they were engaged with certain apps, you could probably get a sense of how much are they being exposed to the intervention app or the messages coming through the intervention by virtue of the data collection. And so then that gives you a sense of, okay, what's their dose of this intervention, as it were? You know, to what degree are they, they really, um, uh, are they really being nudged effectively by the intervention, or being nudged uh, frequently by the intervention, or to what degree is it a much more episodic thing? Are they spending minimal time with the intervention app, for example? Um, the final point here is that intervention delivery management, as you'll see through Ethica, this exceptional system that Mohammed has built, um, uh, the, the delivery and management of this intervention uh, can often share mechanisms with the data collection. So Ethica can be used to deliver these interventions. These, this messaging, it can be used to deliver uh, encouragement to nudge people at certain points um, and based on, on their behavior, et cetera. Um, so, so this is a subcase of examining the effects of interventions where smartphone-based data collection is just, it, 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 it's leaving money on the table if you're not doing it because it can be done often with the same mechanisms, with the same systems, and give a much better sense about what's going on and what the impacts of that intervention is. So um, 
moving towards the later part of this uh, presentation, another um, use is, is of, of these devices, trying to understand uh, choice context. When people choose, make different choices, whether it's physical activity, sedentary behavior. This is some work uh, uh, that I've been privileged to do with, um, with Erica that was really eye-opening to me. I mean, it, it, it shocked me. Um, to see the different patterns of smoking and, and uh, vaping um, in, in individuals who, who uh, did engage in both, um, and, and to see particularly the longer periods of vaping that were, were observed compared to periods of smoking which were more episodic. So this is an aspect of sort of the micro behavior of these that reflect context and choice and also where people were vaping, where they were smoking. Um, for example, vaping in cars. Um, what prompted use of an e-cigarette versus a cigarette, for example, or location of use um, uh, with respect to you know, social events, home, work, et cetera, which exhibited some statistical, uh, statistical differences. Um, finally, um, uh, I want to talk about um, the use of, of these devices to understand something that's of great, justifiably of great concern, great significance, and an increasing significance and in our, particularly in our youth, um, but a growing segment of our population. Um, so I had mentioned before and I'm tempted to show it, but I don't want to give you whiplash, um, that smartphones serve as this key nexus between an electronic world and a physical world. And so much of what goes on um, today in terms of exposure to messaging, to attitudes, beliefs, um, to, to, to belief systems about health is device mediated, particularly for our youth you know, who, for, for, for the elders of us among, uh, you know, in the room, uh, I, you know, I'd rather browse on a, on a browser on my laptop, thank you very much, um, uh, you know, and I'd rather type on my laptop, thank you very much. Um, but, you know, for a growing segment of our population, youth, but also lower SES, individuals um, where the smartphone is that key link to the electronic world that maybe their only electronic um, you know that they're only linked to that world um, everything is centered on this this phone the, the world is, is centered on the phone and the device mediates so much of their exposures of relevance to health and as such it is simultaneously a big influence but simultaneously has access to evidence about those behaviors, knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, et cetera, and exposures that are formidable. Um, so here, smartphones are key to understanding this sort of E context, uh, the electronic world context and, it, and its influence, um, in addition to, to gathering where we are, who we're with, what activities we're engaged in the physical world. Um, so, you know, device communicational behavior gives some indications of what's going on health-wise in the person, but also it's a strong influencer. Um, and uh, I had noted, you know, it, it, it gives that picture on both worlds. And it gives us an understanding of, of, inf of interests and behaviors on the part of a person. Um, their underlying health situation, if they're homesick, etc. This is evidenced by changes of behavior on the phone. Um, uh, you know, and, and exposures in the world are, include things like screen time, app use, as well as in the, in the physical world. So, so this is another major motivator. It's like smartphones have this, and in some ways it's a frightening level of, of position, of centrality, um, uh, of, of privilege almost within, um, within our worlds. And, um, and, you know, I, like lots of other people, feel ambiguous about it. They provide us this window 
into health police attitudes uh, and to influences on them that is therefore unprecedented, you know, as to, to what's going on. And with a fully consenting individual who, who understands uh, in, in an informed way what's, uh, uh, what's at stake in terms of, of offering up information, um, they do provide this really formidable um, portrait of, of, of what's, uh, what's taking, taking place with respect to many of the key health, um, health considerations. So smartphones provide um, this, these types of insights at multiple levels of scale. And I'll, I'll, I'll just note it here. From uh, the self and informal level, where they can provide sort of this per more perfect mirror, Jenny Basran speaks about um, smartphones as, as providing a potentially a fingerprint of function for older individuals, those living with complex conditions, those living with multiple morbidities, and capturing an understanding of their situation and its change over time in response to, um, uh, to treatments, in response to uh, emergence of new conditions, in response to progress of existing conditions. And so self and informal care, smartphones give us a, a window onto this, this key factor out there um, that, that is often under evidence. What goes on in the community with someone who's suffering, like with, uh, with, with the work from Erica that I so admire, the COPD, um, from the COPD side, what's going on for that person's life after discharge in their home? What's going on in their, their circle of care? Um, what's, uh, what's taking place in terms of their level of exacerbations that they're experiencing day to day in a way that may be only limited, we get limited insight in through, through our clinical encounters with providers. Um, at the level of clinical management, this information can help us understand patient challenges, uh, challenges to self-care, uh, informal care, symptoms, and, 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 and context. Um, I, uh, I, I see it in uh, a growing amount of uh, my, uh, my circle of, of uh, family and, and friends. The, the growing use of extra degrees of recording to try to understand um, uh, one situation, whether it's measuring INR levels for, um, for individuals who have uh, uh, needs for, for concerns about hypercoagulation of blood, or whether it's levels of uh, oxygen saturation. These extra devices we can use in our homes can provide us an understanding of, of, of our needs and how those needs are changing over time. Um, and uh, it can better judge when uh, a treatment is, is successfully meeting those needs. And with the patient involved in that, uh, in the home, it provides that extra window of evidence outside of the clinical uh, context, in, in patient context. So health services delivery, um, a growing use of these sorts of tools have been in facilities to understand inefficiencies, bottlenecks, quantifying delays, identifying challenges of coordination of, of teams, offering that team-based care that's, that's uh, so sought after. So here, basically using these devices to capture um, an individual's uh, uh, journey through an inpatient or, or outpatient setting and understanding um, where there's uh, needless loss of efficiencies or where uh, the team-based care can be offered more uh, effectively or where additional resources are needed to help it operate at, at full capacity. So health service delivery uses um, are evidenced in some of the um, references I provided in the background information uh, in which you may have interest. And at the public health level, um, I have a great deal of interest in, in and leveraging these tools, whether it's uh, faster detection of outbreaks and, and localizing those outbreaks or evaluating control strategies, understand the degree of social distancing that's occurring, following advisories, how much risk exposure people are engaged in for things like West Nile, 
to what degree are they really following advisory guidelines about not being out in the evening outside or, or, or limiting contact with, um, with areas of high brush, et cetera, um, or using, um, using appropriate personal protective mechanisms? To what degree are those being followed before and after an advisory? Uh, of great interest. And we have some studies we've conducted related to this. And finally, strategic uh, decision making. Um, these mechanisms, together with the sorts of models that several in the room build, I think provide a formidable tool for asking what if questions and asking about intervention, uh, intervention strategies. OK, um, so I provided a whirlwind discussion here of, of what I see as some major motivations for, uh, uh, for data collection. But really, a lot of them come down to the challenges of traditional tools and the growing challenges of those tools as um, in light of technology change, in light of uh, be, uh, attitudinal change with respect to opting into traditional studies um, and into what is, constitutes a burden um, in terms of, of uh, involvement as a participant. And I've highlighted this this key nexus occupied by mobile devices. Smartphones, yes. Wearables, yes. Um, that straddle between this electronic world, which offers formidable um, significance for shaping knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors on the health side, and this physical world, which likewise has, um, has a tremendous impact on, on the health, healthy behaviors which we can um, sustainably undertake uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. And smartphones as this tool to, to, to span both. Within this, um, within this event, we're going to be talking about how smartphone data collection can evidence these worlds, can help us understand those influences, can help us understand the degree to which uh, the, the behaviors associated with interventions um, are indeed being modified successfully, and the degree to which uh, an, individual's, um, an individual's behaviors uh, are reflected in, in shifts in knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs. So the Ethica tool, which was built to use this, uh, this interface um, uh, shown here, uh, will be shown in as much as it runs on smartphones, in as much as it can also leverage wearables, um, and in as much as, as it can, um, in the near future, will be available on web as well. So Erica, yeah. Thank you. I, I love this um, picture, just because I, I think it really, is, I hadn't really thought of it that way about the linkage, but mm -hmm. that's a beautiful illustration of it. Um, when I'm thinking about y capturing youth, for instance, and um, their exposure to things related to vaping and smoking and yes. cannabis use, potentially, um, they, I realize now with my kids, they use Snapchat as their primary mechanism um, of communicating with their peers. Right. Is that is that possible to capture using the Ethica app? Because um, they, you know, it comes up and then it disappears. But can can the phone capture that? So um, it, it can capture certain aspects, um, and Mohammed can talk, you know, about about this more. So Ethica can capture information on use of apps, um, so which apps are being used, um, and can capture aspects of how much time people are, are engaged in um, use of their device, so the, the screen on and off time, so screen time in a blunter way. In terms of the actual messaging that's received, the situation here is, is very platform specific. So um, let me highlight just a few a few things uh, before I, I get to Snapchat in, in particular. So Ethica does offer, um, and a lot of these are available on a per platform, a platform specific basis, because uh, iOS has some tighter restrictions. But for example, um, uh, incoming calls or outgoing calls or incoming SMSs and outgoing SMSs. Um, that's something which um, one can uh, enable as a data source 
within the context of Ethica. Um, Mohammed, that's uh, uh, Android specific, is that right? Which one, the app users? Uh, no, the uh, SMS and, yes, that's and, and phone, yes, phone that's calls uh, coming in, phone calls go, going out. Um, and uh, so, so that's, uh, that's Android specific. Browsing related behavior, um, uh, we do have studies. So a study we ran with, uh, uh, with uh, Vish Vishwanath at, at Dana-Farber at Harvard, um, and, and which was one of, of two studies in which we've collaborated, made extensive use of um, a browser-based information that would capture URLs and, and the page contents when it messaged smoking or cigarettes or you know, nicotine. It would capture um, full page contents so you could look at what people were exposed to and Chen Yang, uh, who I don't know if is in the room right now, but she did some amazing analysis of this showing showing you know the, the page contents and, and using word clouds to summarize what people are exposed to as smokers or non-smokers, etc. Um, when it comes to uh, platforms, these social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and Instagram, etc. Um, the the needs are so Ethica right now's ability to to tap content in those is is not really uh, significant. Like it can't. It's not looking at what you post in Snapchat or what you post in Twitter. Now. That being said, we have extensive um, separate infrastructure set up, for example, for monitoring Twitter-related content. So in our lab, I think now we have somewhere between 200 and 300 million tweets archived, uh, more or less complete tweets from certain areas of Western Canada. And you know, there's the potential for cross-linking that information with what Ethica is providing for a person, looking at the tweets outgoing from that person, and by, by having them report what they subscribe to, you could look at tweets coming into that person through this mechanism here. And the typical route we've explored for social media is exactly that. Um, by, by being allowed to have a certain degree of permissions on these sites that are posting, let's say Facebook, um, uh, you, can, you can get a sense through a, a parallel data collection mechanism about what's being posted and then link it in with what's captured in Ethica. Ethica itself, in terms of, it, it can know that that app is running, how much it's being used, but it's not going to see that you posted this picture on that app without you know um, some sort of, of separate linkage that captures those outgoing messages with uh, with with what's on uh, what's on Ethica and there's some reasons for that basically the platforms the both Android and iOS don't allow one application to snoop into all aspects of the other application so. What we can know is significant, which is okay. This person is a heavy user of, app, of, of, of you know Snapchat. What we don't know is exactly what that content they're seeing, unless we take uh, have other agreements with them to share that that content at some level through us through through separate Snapchat related mechanisms or Facebook related mechanisms or Twitter related mechanisms. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, and I think. You know, in principle, one could have a self-report there, where someone someone could take a screenshot. So every time they got a post, you could, you know, you pay them, you know, fifty cents for each time they take a post of snapshot, a, 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 a Snapchat photo. You, you get them to do a screenshot, which is easy to do on either of those platforms, and then they could report that via Ethica. You know, I just posted this, or I just saw this, but that's. You know that's fairly high burden in today's day and day and age, but uh, maybe with the right incentive, maybe not, maybe not much so. Maybe if you gave them Hulu coupons or something. <laughs> I don't want to suggest adverse uh, rewards, but um, but uh, you know you might be able to to um, encourage behavior that would actually 
have them contribute um, contribute those uh, those things. Or maybe you could ask them post your most recent Snapchat post by EMAs that remind them once every you know when they um, once it once a day to post something, and you get a, a flavor of what they're posting. Good. Other questions, comments. Yes. I have a question now. Sure. With the studies that you have presented, how long does it take to get the data from like, a statistically significant sample? Mm. Well, it depends a lot, so it's a good question. We will talk about uh, the analysis quite a lot in the third day. What I'll tell you is that um, uh, this this is tied up with recruitment, right? Because because you need to build up uh, a large enough uh, a large enough group um, to contribute that you're going to be uh, capturing uh, information from you know, a, a group that's acceptable. It also has to do with what, when you're saying statistically significant sample, what behavior you're measuring and whether it's longitudinal in a given person. Um, one notable feature about big data, normally when I've given past versions of this boot camp, I've, I've, had, a, I've had a talk which is big data health and, and I highlight the four feet, big data. Operationally, the least bad definition I know is it's data um, that's characterized by high volume, that's the big. It's characterized by high velocity, meaning it comes in frequently. It's characterized by high variety, meaning it, like a given data source, say a, small, a, a phone, will capture multiple types of data at once about the same, say, person and at that time, right? So, so you get this kind of thickened picture of these different evidence of these different generative pathways often, but these different areas of, of their life, you know, captured in that timeline we saw. And then finally, uh, captured by high veracity, meaning you have, you have you know, physical evidence of what they ate rather than just what they said, you know. Um, and one feature of this data is that often from a given individual, you have much more in the way of data points than you do have counts of individuals in the study. So you might have you know, um, uh, hundreds of, of survey responses uh, uh, from, from a given individual, even if your study was only dozens you know, in size. Or you might have from step counts, thousands and thousands of step counts, even though you, know, you have uh, hundreds, hundreds um, of people in the study. And when you talk about statistical significance, you know, uh, there's a very real question to ask, um, what is the sample over which you're conducting um, that, uh, you know, a, a hypothesis test, for example, um, is it a collection just of people, you know, where each sample is one person, or is it a collection within a given person's experience associated with successive data points, um, which is often what we do as well. Um, where we may get from a given person in the course of a day, you know, some sort of statistically significant sample with respect to some level of sedentary behavior during that day or step counts for that day. So, so I think we'll want to unpack this a little bit more in coming sessions, but I welcome that question and it points to a large amount of discussion we're going to have in this event on the analysis side. So I, I welcome that. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, you know, I like that, you know, you're reducing the burden to the participant and especially I'm thinking around like diet. Yeah. Um, you know, the gold standard is 24 hour recalls. Yeah. Which people say reduces recall bias, et cetera, et cetera. So when, have, has this been validated, like the picture based um, collection compared to that? And how, how do you deal with that? Because you're, very good question. Yeah. So, so um, Mohammed's actually going to talk about 24-hour um, recall interface to Ethica. So, you folks are here at a critical time for Ethica. Ethica is, has grown from being, um, you know, a, a, a speck in the cosmic eye um, to to being, 
you know, Muhammad overwhelmingly. And now it's actually, it's, it's, it's got, uh, got five people uh, working with it and, and, and very rapid development going on along a lot of lines. One of the lines relates to this, which is tapping into standardized instruments. And as you, uh, you know, uh, have known, you've forgotten more about in the past week than I've ever known, you know, there's, there's this um, uh, web-based 24-hour um, uh, recall um, site that is maintained. I think it's out of the CDC, is it? Uh, and it's CI, I think, the ASA 24. Yeah, yeah. 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 and one of the, one of the, the, the directions uh, Ethica is going, you'll hear a lot about them and, and Ethica is where Ethica is going in coming months, but one of them involves um, an interface within Ethica Studies so that you can do 24-hour recall through that site within the Ethica app. And that's one way of capturing it through validated instruments. Cheryl here has done amazing work with um, dietary elicitation through Ethica and also comparing it in the context of recall. Um, and uh, with a study of, what, 90 to 100, 100 people for about three months um, with photos as well as um, uh, text-based uh, self-report. Self um, and uh, she would be a, a really good person to talk to about this. Um, we're also at a point uh, in, in Ethica's use where this whole comparison with validated instruments um, from the standpoint of not merely duplicating those validated instruments, so that's done a lot with Ethica, you know, with, with duplicating um, uh, standard, you know, uh, standard instruments within the context of Ethica so that we can, um, we can uh, leverage the strength of those instruments. But beyond that, using Ethica to compare with, um, you know, like the IPAC, the International Physical Activity Questionnaire, and comparing that critically to what's available using um, step counts and uh, more fine-grained reporting, um, not with an eye towards does it um, does it equal that, but where where is one stronger than the other? This is going on a lot right now, and uh, my colleague Tarun Kanapali down in um, in Regina is particularly active on the physical activity front. Um, and uh, you know, for the for the nutritional front, there's also some some needs there. So uh, I would like to suggest that um, you might want to talk with Mohammed and and Cheryl about that. But um, there is uh, very very large amounts of attempts to right now try to cross Ethica with validated instruments and compare compare with those instruments. Okay. Other questions? I'd welcome, I'd love it if we can have this be an interactive boot camp because there's going to be a, a lot of opportunities for, for us to address your particular questions uh, more effectively if, if you want to raise them. And, and we can kind of spend our time on areas of interest to you. Okay? So this lecture was an anomaly today um, uh, in the sense that we're going to be spending most of the day going through the nitty gritty of mechanisms in Ethica. Um, see how you can build up sophisticated studies that can capture evidence from this electronic world, capture evidence from this world, uh, the physical world here, um, can capture instruments, be they validated or, or novel, uh, with the survey survey based system, um, and that's going to be the, the the challenge to which we turn our attention following the break. Okay. Absent any questions now, I think we'll have a bit of a of a tea break, and we will reconvene with uh, Mohammed taking the rightful stage. Okay. So thanks very much. Thank you.